Got a picture up on the board right now. What is that? Yep. Yeah, it's, it's an atom, right? It's just a generic atom, although it's got two electrons, so I suppose it's not generic. It's defined as probably helium, right? Um, well, we're going to call it just a generic atom. Uh, those things that are orbiting around or circling around that thing in the middle, what are these things called? They're called electrons, right? And electrons have what kind of a charge? Negative. What is this thing in the middle? Kevin? The nucleus. And inside the nucleus are two different things. What makes up the nucleus? What's one of the things that makes up the nucleus, Vlad? What's one of the things inside? Yep, neutrons. If I could spell it, that would be nice. And what's the other thing that makes up the, the uh, nucleus? Kenton? What's the charge of the neutron? What's the charge of the neutron? It's neutral. There's no charge, right? And what's the charge of the proton? Positive. Now, this diagram isn't drawn to scale. We know that the nucleus, um, although it's very, very, very heavy compared to the rest of the nucleus, it makes up the vast majority of the mass of the nucleus. It's also very, very, very small compared to the size of the atom itself. If we were to draw this to scale, and the nucleus was as big as it is drawn right here, then those electrons would be orbiting around the nucleus, not at that distance away, but probably several kilometers away from the nucleus. That's how big the atom is compared to the size of the nucleus itself. But the nucleus is heavy, much heavier than the rest of the nucleus, about, sorry, than the rest of the atom, about a thousand times heavier than the atom itself. Now, um, let's take a look at... Um, a little bit more detail of, of uh, what these things do, what these electrons do, what these protons do, and what these neutrons do in terms of their interactions. If we get a bunch of atoms together, then we have an object. Okay, we have a, maybe we have a compound. Maybe we have a bunch of compounds in that object. Now, in that object, that object can be either neutrally charged or positive charged or negatively charged. If we have an object that is positively charged, it's clearly going to come from something in the nucleus, but not just one thing, but rather a combination of things. Can anybody explain to me how an object is positively charged? Not how it gets there, but what the properties of it are when it is positively charged. Taking a look at the atom that we have drawn here. If we have a positively charged object, it doesn't mean that we have just protons, right? What does it mean, Joey? Uh, it means it's lost an electron or more than one electron. Bottom line is it means um, it's got more protons than electrons. However it got that way, okay, however it got to be positively charged, however it got more protons than electrons, it's got more. And if you have an object that's negatively charged, it's exactly the opposite, right? It means you have more electrons than protons. Now, Joe, you alluded to, to something there just a minute ago when you answered, answered a little bit more of the question than I had intended, actually. You said it's lost an electron. A positively charged object has lost an electron. Similarly, a negatively charged, uh, charged object must gain an electron or more electrons, right? Why is it, Joey, that it's the electrons that do the moving? If something's going to move, if something's going to become charged and become positively charged, why does it have to lose electrons? Why can't it gain protons? If it's going to become negatively charged, why does it have to gain electrons? Why can't it lose protons? Why is it that it's the electrons, if anything does the moving, that it's electrons that do the moving as opposed to the protons? Take a look at the diagram again. Yep. Good. It's easier for the electrons to move than the protons that are in the nucleus. Now, the reason for that is because um, the forces that are interacting in here, in this atom, there's a couple forces that we're concerned about right now. There's the electric force. That electric force is an attractive force. It keeps the electrons um, fairly tightly bound to the nucleus. Just like 
um, a balloon may be attracted to your hair after the balloon has been rubbed against something because they're oppositely charged. The electron will be attracted to the nucleus because they're oppositely charged as well. So there's an attractive force there that keeps the electrons bound to the nucleus. But then there's another force that acts within the nucleus that we call the strong nuclear force. It's a force that acts between proton and proton and between neutron and neutron, and between proton and neutron. It's an attractive force, and over a short distance, the distances that are involved in the nucleus, it's a stronger force. So, you got to overcome a force in order to move something from the atom. It's easier to overcome the electric force that acts between the electron and the nucleus than it is to overcome the strong nuclear force that acts between protons and protons and protons and neutrons. So if something's going to move, it's going to be the electrons because it's easier to overcome that force. Now, it is possible to get rid of protons out of nuclei. It is possible to change the number of protons. That's not, that doesn't happen under normal circumstances, though. That's not an electrical interaction when protons leave the nucleus. That's a nuclear reaction. And that's a much bigger deal than an electrical interaction. That's a much bigger deal than rubbing a balloon against your hair and then putting it against a wall and laughing because it sticks to the wall. Okay? Now we're talking about a nuclear reaction that's, that's generating a whole lot more energy than friction ever will. That doesn't happen under normal circumstances. So if something's going to move, it's going to be the electrons. Either you lose electrons to make it positively charged, or you gain electrons to make it negatively charged. Why is that the case? Because it's easier for electrons to move about. All right, let's talk about the charge now, or sorry, the unit for charge. We get positively charged objects. We get negatively charged objects. Charge has a unit. It can be quantified, and therefore it has a unit, just like speed can be quantified and has a unit. Just like acceleration and energy are quantified and have units. The unit for speed, meters per second. Energy, joules. The unit for acceleration, meters per second squared. For distance, meters. The unit for charge is the coulomb, named after a guy Charles Augustine de Coulomb. Now, this is a big unit. Just like a light year would be a big unit for distance, just like a kilometer per second would be a big unit for speed, a coulomb is a big unit for charge, a really big unit for charge. So big that it would take about this many electrons to make up one full coulomb of charge. It's about 10 to the 19 electrons to make up a coulomb of charge. If it takes that many electrons, then this is a big unit of charge. What is this, the unit, uh, sorry, what is the amount of charge on an electron exactly? Well, if it takes that many electrons to make a, a coulomb of charge, then that means the charge of an electron is going to be a pretty small number, right? Similarly, the charge of a proton is going to be a small number because they actually have the same amount of charge. One's positive, one's negative. I want you to look at your data sheet for a second. Everybody take out that data sheet. Pull out this page, have it in front of you. I want you to look for the charge of the electron and the charge of the proton on that data sheet, please. Who's got it? Yep. We see the charge of an electron is negative 1e, e and um, similarly, the charge of a proton is positive 1e. E. What does that mean exactly? Because we want to measure in coulombs, not in e's. What's an e? Well, if we look on the left-hand side of our data sheet over here, we're going to see this term an elementary charge. And you don't really know what that means right now. You will find out later on in the year what it means. For now, just trust me that an elementary charge has a value of 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19. The symbol for an elementary charge is the E. So if we want to express the charge of an electron in coulombs, we're going to say the electron has a charge. Okay, let's write it down like this. Q is the symbol for charge. So the charge of an electron would be negative 1 negative 1 times 1 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs, or negative 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. The charge of a proton would be positive 1e, which would be 
positive 1 times the elementary charge, which is given to us on the left side of the data sheet, which just gives us a, a charge of positive 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. So same charge, except opposite sign. Both small numbers, because it takes a whole lot of them to make up a coulomb of charge. You'll use those numbers so often in this unit and through this year that you'll probably just remember the numbers. You probably won't need to check your data sheet to know what the charge of an electron is. But it's there if you need to check. Just remember that if you need to check, you're not going to find it in one step. It's not as simple as finding uh, the gravitational constant. Okay, if you want the charge of an electron, you need to look in two places. First, here, to find that it's negative 1 times the elementary charge, and then over here to find out what the elementary charge is. Let's define a couple of terms here now. Related to these electrons that can move, right? We talked about electrons moving potentially because they're not as tightly bound to the nucleus as the protons are. These two terms relate to what we just talked about there. A conductor is, let's get to find a conductor. You've done this before. Grade 9 or grade 8, I can't remember when it was, but yeah. Okay, something conducts electricity, but we're kind of defining a term in terms of itself there. So can anybody give me a little bit more detail on that? Something that conducts electricity? What does that mean exactly? Mark? Okay, something that allows electron flow. Okay, a bit of a, a building of that. Something that allows electron flow. Why does it allow electron to flow? Well, a conductor allows electrons to flow because the electrons in the outermost regions of that atom aren't as tightly bound to the nucleus as in other atoms. Right? We say the electrons aren't as tightly bound to the nucleus as the protons are, but in some atoms, they're even less tightly bound than in other atoms. Those are called conductors, when we have the electrons of the outermost regions that are freer to move. If you've taken chemistry, you might know some examples of materials in which the electrons in the outermost regions are fairly free to move. Anybody give me a general category of materials in which the electrons are pretty free to move about? Yep. Metals. Metals. What do you think of when you think of an electrical conductor? You think of metals, right? Why are metals good conductors? Because the electrons in the outermost regions aren't as tightly bound. They are more free to move from atom to atom. Now, it doesn't take much to figure out what a definition for an insulator is. If conductors have electrons in the outermost regions that are free to move, then insulators, which is the exact opposite of a conductor, has electrons that are pretty tightly bound to the nucleus and are not free to move about. Not as free to move about, at least. Even in an insulator, electrons can move easier than protons can. But they're more tightly bound than they are in conductors and less likely to move, therefore. You don't have to copy this down. Just have a look at it, okay? The diagram that you see up on the board right now shows us relative conductivities. Um, these numbers aren't, they don't have any units. So we're not saying that, that uh, silver has a conductivity of 10 to the 8 somethings. Okay? We're saying that relative to something else that has a conductivity of 1, okay, this is 10 to the 8. It's one relative to another. That means that Silver, which is 10 to the 8, rubber, which is 10 to the minus 15, silver have a, has a conductivity that's about 10 to the 23 times bigger than rubber. That's a lot, right? Rubber will still conduct electricity. Don't stand outside in a lightning storm holding up a metal golf club with rubber-soled shoes, because your rubber-soled shoes will still conduct electricity, and you'll still be struck by lightning. Okay, but, but rubber has a conductivity that's about 10 to the 23 times less than silver. So, although your odds aren't good if you're standing out in the lightning storm with rubber sole shoes, they're better than they are if you have silver on your shoes, because silver conducts electricity 10 to the 23 times better. Um, copper is a good conductor. Aluminum is a good conductor. What do you notice about these things that are all good conductors? What do they have in common? 
they're metals. And what do you notice about things that aren't such good conductors? Wood, glass, rubber, and there's a million other examples of that, right? They're, they're non-metals, right? Take a look at some of the best conductors, aluminum, copper, silver. What material do we use to wire our houses? It's metal, right? But what metal is it that wires our houses? Yeah. Copper, yeah. Why do we use copper? Why don't we use silver? Silver is a better conductor than copper. Why don't we use silver? It's way more expensive. Although copper is very expensive now. It's gotten in the last 10, 15 years to be very, very expensive. Um, but it's still a lot cheaper than silver is, obviously. Silver's, um, silver uh, tarnishes a little bit more, too. So um, it, wouldn't be as, it just wouldn't be as practical as copper. We used to use aluminum, by the way. Aluminum's cheaper. Why don't we use aluminum in our houses now? It's almost as good of a conductor as copper. Older houses might have aluminum wiring them in them. Although if you do any rewiring, it has to be switched to copper. Why isn't it safe? Well, aluminum has this, uh, this, this habit of arcing. So you've got a wire here and you've got a wire here. And electrons like to go from here to here without the wire actually being connected. So electrons like to arc from one to the other. And that's a problem. When you've, got, when you've got two wires inside your wall, and electrons will arc from one to the other, then that has this habit of causing fires inside your wall. Okay? And that's not a good thing, not such a good thing. So now we use copper, which can still arc, okay? but it has a lot less likelihood of arcing. Copper is more expensive, okay? but copper is a better conductor, and it has less habit of arcing than, silver, sorry, than aluminum does. Um, don't use iron. Iron rusts. Don't use mercury. Mercury is a liquid. Right, that's not going to work very well. It's not going to work very well in most places. Anybody ever taken apart a thermostat in the house? It's one of the older thermostats, not the electronic ones, but one of the older ones, yes? Um, what does that thermostat consist of inside? Yeah. So that coil that goes around like this, it's, it's what we call a bimetallic strip. Two different metals on each side. So it's, it's, it's a strip that's coiled up that's made out of two, two metals. One metal on one side, one metal on the other side. The idea of that is that when it heats up, when it's warm, okay, these different metals um, expand at different rates. So that means it causes that coil to bend. Okay. So what else does it consist of? There's this little glass tube at the top. This little glass tube that will, that will tilt according to how much that, that the coil bends, right? According to the temperature change, that tube will tilt. There's this little ball of liquid mercury inside that. What happens when that tube tilts? If it tilts this way, like this, then the mercury slides down to that end. That completes a circuit, because now you've got a conductor that's joining one thing to another thing. It completes a circuit, and electricity will actually flow through that, that liquid metal, that liquid conductor, and that will turn your furnace on. Make sense? So we do use mercury as a conductor. It's a good conductor. Okay, it's not practical to use in the walls of our house, obviously. Okay, it's practical for certain things. Okay. We'll finish it up today with three laws of electric charge. And these three laws of electric charge are somewhat intuitive. I mean, not intuitive in the sense that a five-year-old would know these, but intuitive in the sense that, um, you know, you're in grade 12, you probably have some kind of grasp that opposite charges attract. Right? When you get positive, you get negative, they'll attract each other. They'll pull each other towards each other. And that's what we mean by attracting, right? They, they pull towards each other. You might have some kind of grasp, intuitive grasp, that like charges repel each other. So that means that positive will repel positive. That means push away, by the way. Positive pushes away positive, and negative pushes away negative. They don't like each other. Negatives and negatives, positives and positives. And finally, this is the third one. This one's a little bit trickier, although it might not seem particularly tricky right now. 
charged objects attract neutral objects. We're not saying that positive attracts neutral or negative attracts neutral. We're saying charged objects attract neutral objects. The reason we're mentioning that objects, putting that objects word in there is because reality is you got lots of things in the nucleus, right? Protons and neutrons, lots of them, potentially, depending upon the atom. Protons do not attract neutrons. Protons do not attract neutrons, and neutrons don't attract protons, even though they're positive and neutral. Neutrons don't attract electrons, even though they're neutral and negative. But rather, neutral objects will attract positive, or neutral objects will attract negative. We're not going to learn until the first of next week why that's the case. But for now, you're just going to trust me on that. Okay? Positive doesn't attract neutral. Positive attracts neutral objects. You have to have not a neutron, but a neutral object that consists of a whole bunch of protons and electrons. And there's a reason for that, and as I say, you're going to learn it next week.